I was raised on the visual regimen of Catholicism and Technicolor films. The formal elements and constructed narrative of both have informed my work in so many ways that it's become impossible for me to disentangle these influences. Although I reluctantly received a Catholic education from kindergarten through high school, the only religious thoughts I recall were brought on by repeated viewings of films, like Song of Bernadette, The Ten Commandments, or Ben-Hur. I wanted God to test me, to send me the modern equivalent of a leper, so I could care for them, proving my fearlessness, compassion, and love for humanity. I wanted to be a martyr for goodness, but not necessarily for the church. As even at a young age, I had already begun to intuit a myriad of problems with the institution. I come from a deeply dysfunctional family, complete with uncles in several religious orders. I am certain that my art vocation was fueled by the frustrated desire to tell those truths that I suspected my family, the Catholic Church, and Hollywood were hiding. My obsession with bringing dark secrets to light has consumed my work from the very beginning, through decades of seemingly disparate subject matter and radical shifts in media. Despite distancing myself from the church, I have unconsciously fetishized most of its trappings. I obsessively collect red velvet by the yard, as well as vintage guardian angel prints of a certain genre. I recently painted a 12-foot guardian angel on my daughter's nursery wall. Even as I was creating a series of guardian angels who don't come through in my studio. The deep hues of stained glass windows have even inspired the palette for my home. These days, Art has become my religion, but when pressed, I define myself as a recovering Catholic. Catholicism, like alcoholism, is not something you can cure. It's something you learn to live with because you will never eradicate it from the fiber of your being. Growing up surrounded by the seductive colors, slightly out of focus edges, and dramatic light of Catholic imagery, has provided me with a visual and conceptual vocabulary that is an integral part of my makeup. As I have explained several times to Bill Donahue, president of the Catholic Anti-Defamation League, I cannot stop the flow of this language in my art any more than I can stop thinking in English. It is important to note that I work intuitively from the subconscious. I'm highly skeptical of strategic art making. The invitation to present this paper has forced me to analyze and categorize the formal characteristics of my work for the very first time. Although these elements frequently overlap, I have teased apart and identified several Catholic influences upon my work. Light as content, lurid palette, relic preservation, the corporal spiritual correlation, and the overt appropriation of traditional symbols and concepts. It began with light. That light in the Garden of Gethsemane print in my grandparents' living room. Magic light 
the kind that carries content. As a teenager in upstate New York, I snuck out of the house on summer nights just to gaze in wonderment at the warm night air made visible by the street lights. Cut and striated into rays by the glowing maple leaves. I didn't realize until years later that my early night landscapes were replicating the light from devotional images that had mesmerized me since childhood. I taught myself traditional Renaissance glazing in order that my canvases might glow, and my continuing emphasis on light would be as powerful as possible. A few years later, I came to the conclusion that it was actually truth I was after. People are more real at night, revealing more of themselves at 2 a.m. than they do in broad daylight. So I began to incorporate figures into my nocturnal work. At the same time, professors told me to loosen up my painting technique. I responded by getting ridiculously tight, working with the tiniest brushes I could find. Paintings like this one took me nine months to execute. I began to doubt my sanity. Making these pieces, often working through the night in isolation, began to feel like a type of penance or sublimation that I seemed to have little control over. In my mind, meticulously weaving the lace with paint and making each stitch of the pillow's tapestry had something to do with revealing a truth. Showing everything, especially the things that no one wanted you to notice. I did a series of women sleeping in cars, the Beauty Rest series. These paintings of women as passive passengers mark changes in the way that I consciously thought about light as a strong, formal, and conceptual element. Here, light carries content in the same way that color and form does, the exterior green light depicting the threatening world that the ensconced women seek protection from. The Vigil series focused on a sense of loss following the realization that the rest of the world was not playing by the same Catholic technicolor rules that I followed. Deciding not to hide behind a constructed narrative any longer, I focused on straightforward self-portraits, practicing radical vulnerability as defiant act. Promise is a crying self-portrait executed in charcoal. The parts of the face that swell when one cries are emphasized through color. At the time, I was house-sitting for a colleague and had been up all night creating the drawing. I collapsed into bed at 5 a.m. to the sound of pounding rain and awoke the next morning to find a single leak in the roof of that 2,000-square-foot house, directly above my easel. The exact center of the drawing had tears of dirty rainwater running down the face. I impulsively blotted the drawing before realizing that the rain was an appropriate addition. The religion of art, like Catholicism, has its miracles. Several self-portraits followed. Showing a darker side to other human beings in an attempt to connect and make them feel as though they are not alone. This piece, Extinguish, marked the end of the self-portraits. Once the vigil ends, the reflection disappears, allowing one to see through the window again to the real world outside.
This large charcoal drawing entitled A Conscious Decision Regarding the Possibility of the Existence of Magic, along with a small silver point drawing, The Exorcism of Faith, were made during two consecutive summers at an artist's residency program. On the first day of each residency, a dead bird appeared serendipitously. Year one, on the doorstep to my cottage, and year two, falling out of the sky to land on the hood of my car outside the Piggly Wiggly, presenting itself for me to draw. The vigil series culminated in the six by eight foot painting, Fate of a Technicolor Romantic, which took me a full year to paint. It began as a self-portrait, heavy with familial shame and crammed with all of the books and films that created my quixotic beliefs. The painting evolved into a war of light between reality, represented by the dim 40-watt light bulb, and the blue light of idealism glowing from the Technicolor film on TV. The process involved in creating this painting was a kind of physical manifestation of repress repression. After 11 months of painting painstaking detail with single hair brushes, all of the objects receive both a physical and psychological pushing back through the many layers of glazes applied to the painted surface, a terrifying act of faith to perform, incidentally. Sacred Ovaries depicts the conundrum of desiring a child, but knowing that you will, despite all your therapy and best intentions, pass on some familial pathologies. I mapped the sacred heart, a Catholic symbol of devotional love, onto the ovaries, and then filled the kitchen with symbols that embody potentially dangerous human frailties. This piece, shown at Agnes Scott College, prompted my first email dialogue with Bill Donahue, who demanded to know, quote, what the hell this painting is supposed to be about, unquote. I explained to him that I thought it was a sincere, reverent painting and was told, quote, that's what you artists always say, unquote. Relics are defined as objects carefully preserved for purposes of veneration or as a tangible memorial. And relics have appeared extensively in my work. The entire series of human hair embroideries began with the use of my own hair. My young lover uses the curls of an ex-boyfriend, threading each hair individually through the pillowcase so it appears to grow out of the case, cascade around the embroidered ear and across the pillow. 
My boyfriend brought me his golden locks in a box one day, saying, I think you love my hair more than me. I kept the hair on display in a glass box for several years before it evolved into this piece. Newer work in this series is embroidered on found fabric and doilies stretched under convex glass in Victorian frames to emphasize the relic-like nature of the pieces. The three months spent on each two by three inch piece is an act of 21st century resistance and is part of the gift given to the viewer. At a certain point, working with illusional space became inadequate. It was too distanced. I wanted to go deeper, to get inside other people's skin. We normally use garments to construct an identity, a conscious choice of our own packaging presented to the world. I became interested in creating clothes that reveal psychological states rather than concealing them leaving us beyond naked and turning the insides out. The defense mechanism coat, made with 150 pounds of roofing nails, features all the major veins and arteries of the body embroidered on the velvet inside. Bleed is made from a pair of Victorian leather gloves, whose serendipitous gesture now reminds me of Grunwald's Crucified Christ. The stigmata happen spontaneously, a result of a weak spot in the shrinking leather. The physical memory last goodbye dress, made of washed silk, records all the points of contact of two people embracing for the last time, burning the sensation into the brain as a physical memory to relive at will. The Shroud of Turin reference did not occur to me until long after the piece was finished. Individuation is a psychological term defining a natural, healthy separation from one's family of origin as one becomes an independent adult. Individuation dress is embroidered from top to bottom with the text, I am not them, I am not them. The lace sash embroidered with the words love, guilt, love, guilt, encircles the waist of the dress before trailing onto the floor. The family of origin seeps up to stain the white surface, disintegrating the individuation mantra. We were taught in school that all babies were born with a stain on their souls, the mark of Adam and Eve's original sin. Unless the babies were baptized, that stain would always remain, preventing the children from getting into heaven. My variation on this chilling visual concept draws parallels between psychology and a thought from Exodus 34. In both, the sins of the fathers stain children for several generations. Some garments were a specific reaction to the limits placed upon me by my Catholic education. The passive repressed anger dress is a found dress featuring swallowed passive phrases like, I'm okay, no, you go first, and I'm sorry, in hand-embroidered text starting as white in the throat 
darkening in color, and finally nodding in the stomach as a bile-colored tangle of text under the surface layer of Georgette. The Primer for Life dress is a Catholic school uniform used as a suffocating corset around a woman's business suit. With embroidered phrases about humility and the evil of money, words that bind when negotiating a dog-eat-dog -dog world as an adult. I worked on Heart Center early in my pregnancy when the pregnancy was tenuous and I was confined to bed. In an extreme example of work as prayer, I can remember thinking of the baby as I embroidered, consciously making each stitch as a way of sewing her in and keeping her. Upon the occasion of my daughter's birth, I became almost agoraphobic, irrationally figuring that if we never left the house, nothing bad could ever happen to her. Stay, made with her first pair of shoes and baby blankets, addressed some of these complex feelings of motherhood. Your fragility is a simultaneous invocation for my daughter's safety and a confession of my own newly hyperbolized emotional vulnerability. The hair used is that which was on my head during the time that I dreamt of her, during the time that I carried her. Like rings of a tree, a length of hair embodies the passage of time, carrying a discernible record of an organism's extreme life experiences. The repetitive act of embroidery seems to be made for calming worry, trying to tie things down, sew them in, make them stay. Embroidering with hair possesses its own unique intensity. Each barely perceptible stitch is like a rosary bead, marking a tiny but ardent prayer whispered over and over. After devoting 25 years of my life to making art, exclusive of everything else, adapting to motherhood was difficult. Knowing that women artists are traditionally written off after becoming mothers, I was determined to continue working. I stayed up late and got up early, but there were days when I did not get to make anything, which contributed to a deepening depression. I created the Art Marks Project to get me through that first year and made 48 tiny works. All of these works that I have shown you are the context for the work I am about to present. Back in 2006, I began to work in the studio full time and after 20 years of going solo, finally signed up to work with my first commercial gallery. Around this time, I had this overwhelming urge to do an assumption painting. I longed to paint glowing clouds, pooty, the earth below. I gathered reference information, then promptly put it away, thinking, you've never done anything so over-the-top religious and kitschy, you can't make this work. This cycle happened two or three times. I'd feel like I desperately needed to do this painting, but then I would cast this ridiculous idea aside. One day, I was in line at the supermarket. Looking around, I noticed that every single magazine cover featured a picture of Angelina Jolie holding her children. So, the assumption painting became Blessed Art Thou, from a prayer phrase, Blessed Art Thou Among Women, a painting about the cycle of celebrity worship, particularly as it relates to consumerism and self-esteem. Bathing the bottom part of the painting in green light was a way of casting the figures in an aspect 
to convey the mood and of an oppressive, artificially lit environment that drives someone with a difficult life to pick up magazines for a taste of fantasy. Predictably, everyone focuses on this part of the painting. But the painting is really about these people. Blessed Art Thou was shown at the Miami Art Fair in January of 2007, but before the fair opened, it had appeared on every news network and in every major newspaper in the world. The initial excitement of my 15 minutes quickly evolved into an unsavory, sometimes terrifying chapter in my career. Up to this time, I had been leading a fairly sheltered, studio-centered life. No TV for 25 years, no tabloids, no shopping malls. The world that enveloped me after the painting's release was made up of all the things I had deliberately distanced myself from my entire life. I was exposed to a lot of ugly, snarky celebrity website criticism. I received death threats from Christian extremists and we installed an alarm system in our house. People latched on to the painting to use it for, for some extremely odd agendas. I learned about the news cycle and I was invited to talk about the work on several radio stations that were only looking for an opportunity to tie it into a new TV program about tabloids. Most significantly, I learned that the average American does not understand the concept of metaphor. I now think of this work as a type of performance piece, temporarily foisting me into the very system that I was critiquing. A second, related piece was sketched up and ready to go, but I put it away, as this was not the type of exposure I wanted for my work. Perhaps the most difficult thing to deal with was the accusation by people I had never met, after 25 years of making difficult, largely unsaleable work and avoiding commercial galleries, that I had simply done this piece for the publicity. After Blessed Art Thou, my new gallery guaranteed me a spot in the next art fair with whatever piece I wanted to present to them. In my mind, the only thing I could possibly do would be to create a painting about the vulgarity of art fairs. Requiem for Vasily and the Ineffable, made at the height of the art market boom, is a triangular canvas referencing Vasily Kandinsky's pyramid theory. The artist as visionary at top of the triangle leading the rest of civilization behind him. I inverted the triangle to represent the market's disempowerment of the artist, who is shown at the bottom, alone in the studio, creating a work that may have tremendous power but becomes just another commodity in this VIP party-like context. In response to millionaire artists who don't make their own work, I then celebrated the workers' garments that I wear when I create my large, time-consuming paintings by myself. I invested even more time into these relics of artistic process by embroidering them with observations about the art world. creating the Art World Truths series.
My most recent series is one of guardian angels who don't come through. The very angels that I collect and love to look at are disintegrated and defaced to reflect the perception of children who have suffered great misfortunes and are seemingly angelless. In any discussion of Catholic imagery appropriation, the elephant in the room is the inevitability of irony and or kitsch. While most of my references were initially unconscious in origin, Virgin Mary Nightlight and Jesus Nightlight contain a guiding and protective light veiled in crudely molded plastic depicting a self-conscious awareness of the, of the sincere intentions of the object depicted, as well as an acknowledgement of its inevitable slide into kitsch. Unlike the devotional objects and images of other religions, which are above ridicule or protected by political correctness, the high drama and stage set artifice of Catholic devotional images makes them especially susceptible to tongue-in-cheek appropriation. There are many cultures for whom the artist is shaman, a medium between the visible world and the spirit world. I, like many other artists, have made art my religion, giving it as much power as any other belief system. Here, Artists are the empaths, the messengers of truth, and the martyrs. They hear a call to their vocation and devote their lives to it, often to their own detriment. There are many artists, from Liza Lou to Joel Peter Whitkin, who have said, my work is my prayer. The first thing I thought of when seeing Andre Serrano's Nomad series was my childhood plea asking God to send me that poor person by the side of the road to help. Ironically, the artists who seemed to enrage Christians the most were all raised Catholic, and the works themselves reflect the kind of virtues that we were taught as Catholic school children. Most notably, a compassion for the suffering, downtrodden, and outcasts. Be they Chris Ophelia's dark complected virgin, David Vonerovich's AIDS work, or Maplethorpe's radiant glorification of those leading an alternative lifestyle. Artists are mapping Christian imagery onto work that espouses what we see as Christian values. So what's the problem? Well, as artists we have a responsibility to question beliefs that are staunchly held by society at large. Frequently, this translate, translates to a rather shallow desecration of symbols, a kind of adolescent naughty mustache drawing on icons that others revere. These works tend to feel light or impotent because they lack the experience, depth, and soul that comes from a lifetime of internalized experiences. When encountering a work that feels transgressive, a dive into the context of the artist's other work usually provides enlightenment. Unfortunately, 
The entrance of a work into the canon of controversial art never begins with an attempt at understanding. Instead, it commences with a few sincere, simple souls who spot a revered image in an unrecognizable context and experience an instantaneous Pavlovian response, screaming blasphemy even as the image hits their retinas. Despite the fact that they might actually agree with concepts put forth by the work, the task of absorbing and processing a new frame of reference is uninteresting to them and consequently never seems to be a part of the dialogue. These victims of discontinued arts and humanities education funding respond to art created for shock value and art revealing a deep and difficult truth in identical ways. Artists raised in a Catholic environment have a very densely layered, complex relationship with the inherent imagery that, I argue, can be simultaneously reverent and transgressive. I myself often feel as though I possess the soul of an outsider artist, obsessive and ardent, trapped inside the educated mind of an academic. My paintings have been called blasphemous and obscene. Yet, I often feel that the earnestness invested into my work is killing me, and that, if anything, the works are becoming too moralistic. Being intellectually aware of the inherent irony and sometimes subtle humor in my imagery, when viewed in the context of our time, does not make my intentions any less sincere. In a world where we are manipulated by media, so many hunger for fame, and popular artists are using calculated marketing strategies that become a part of the game while critiquing it. The public's confusion and suspicions regarding intentionality is understandable. An increasingly jaded and cynical audience thinks artists just make things to piss people off as an easy shortcut to fame. I, however, would cast the majority of artists raised Catholic into a different category. One ruled by a completely uncalculated drive to wail out the truth in their own voice at any cost. Decades ago, Franz Kafka described these messengers. Quote, there are the seductive voices of the night. The sirens, too, sang that way. It would be doing them an injustice to think that they wanted to seduce. They knew they had claws and sterile wombs, and they lamented this aloud. They could not help it if their laments sounded so beautiful. Thank you.